We're following a potential historic peace deal in South Sudan. The country's president and former vice president, who's now the main opposition leader, have agreed to a permanent ceasefire. South Sudan is the world's newest country. It gained independence from Sudan in 2011, but has been engulfed in a devastating civil war for nearly five years. Bloodshed and violence have greatly impacted women living in the war-torn country. They are repeatedly violated and sexually assaulted, especially in the conflict zones. CBS News foreign correspondent Deborah Pata traveled there last year and spoke with some of the women about their traumatic experiences and their will to survive. Inside this refugee camp, stories of unspeakable horror are circulated in whispers. In hushed tones, women tell of being gang raped repeatedly by government soldiers. There is not enough food here, so the women must leave the camp to try and earn a few dollars selling firewood. As soon as these women leave these gates, they become extremely vulnerable. Outside, armed soldiers patrol up and down the roads and prey on these women when they go deep into the forest to collect firewood. Nyejuang Muam told us she was raped by three soldiers in Mayendit, the heart of the famine area. She and her children fled the fighting for the camp and what she thought was a safe haven. But a few weeks ago, she was attacked and raped again when she was out collecting wood. The soldiers divided us among them, she said. We were each raped by three or four soldiers. For an African woman, rape carries the stigma of shame that is hard to bear. I thought I wouldn't be able to live again, she said. I am not thinking about life. Nual Kuol told us Muam's story is repeated far too often. Working for Doctors Without Borders, Kual sits at the front gate of the camp until the sun sets. Her job is to identify rape victims. There is a secret code. I give them this card with a yellow flower, she says. Then they can use it to go for confidential treatment. While we were waiting at the camp gate one evening, this woman told us she was attacked by soldiers. She managed to escape, but her friend was left behind to a terrible fate. She will be raped. They told her to sit down and hit her with rifles, she said. It is a story that wouldn't surprise any woman here. Everyone knows it happens, but nobody wants to break the culture of silence by speaking out. Deborah Pata is with me now from Johannesburg, South Africa. Deborah, these stories are truly difficult to hear, but we have to hear them. We have to know what's what's going on. You talked about in your story the stigma of rape. How is sexual violence used as a weapon of war in this country? And Marie, quite frankly, it's appalling in South Sudan. It's one of the worst situations of human rights abuses I've ever witnessed as a journalist. And I, perhaps it's summed up by one woman who said to me, the best place for a woman to be in South Sudan is dead because living is so hard and the things that happen to women there are so, so terrible. And we just heard countless stories over and over again. The tragic thing about South Sudan is that they were previously, before they became independent, part of Sudan. And in that civil war, rape was a weapon of war that was used against them. Now in their own country, against each other, they continue to have sexual offenses and violence against women. Over and over again, we heard stories of women who were raped in their villages. They were raped as they fled to places of safety. They were raped when they left places of safety to collect firewood. And even in refugee camps like the one that we visited in Bentu, women were not always safe there. 65% of women in South Sudan have been raped. And in the refugee camp we went to, half of the women there had been raped. So staggering statistics. It's the first time in my time as a journalist, as a foreign correspondent, that we as a team and the women on the team were actually told it's advisable that you bring a rape kit, an anti-rape kit, basically anti-retrovirals in the event that you too might be raped. And I think that gives a sense of just how grave the situation is there. Indeed. And so I imagine uh, there's really no sort of option in terms of justice. I mean, here you have a country that's probably in chaos. Is there even a criminal justice system that could attempt to deal with what these women are going through? 
And Marie, that is exactly part of the problem. The United Nations brought out a report about a year ago in which they named both sides of the conflict as having been offenders when it came to rape. But the worst offenders were, in fact, the government soldiers. So when you consider that, there really is no political will to prosecute offenders of rape, particularly when it is on the side of the government so frequently. And as you correctly pointed out, there isn't really a justice system in place there because they're consumed by by the civil war that has engulfed the country for the past five years. So basically women are not getting justice there. And I think too that the international community basically has forgotten about South Sudan. It is not on the international radar at all. So let's talk a little bit about this peace deal between the uh, president and the former vice president. They're, you know, political rivals. It's not like this is the first time that a peace deal has tried to be negotiated. Why does this one seem to hold more promise than the others? I'm not sure that it does, Anne-Marie. I think that is exactly the point, that at the moment, this is a peace deal on paper. Salva Kiir, the president, and his main rival opposition leader, who used to be the vice president, Rick Machar, met um, in neighboring Sudan with the presidents of both Uganda and Sudan, who brokered this peace deal. It's pretty similar to a peace deal that was brokered two years ago, in which they agreed to a unilateral ceasefire. They also have agreed to rebuild the national army with both sides being in that army. Much of the civil war has split along ethnic lines with the Dinka, the majority ethnic group in South Sudan supporting Salva Kiir and the Nuea supporting Rick Mashar. So they're trying to do away with that. That's going to be extremely difficult. There's also no infrastructure. When we visited South Sudan, for example, the airport is nothing more than a tent. That's the international airport in the capital of Juba. So there is a lot of work to be done. This is work that should have been done for seven years now since independence, but it's taken a back foot because of the war that's um, undergone in that country. So what they're going to have to do as well is look at rehabilitating the oil fields. That could be a source of valuable income for the country in the future. But at the moment, this is a peace deal on paper, and the jury's still out whether it will stick and become a peace deal in spirit as well. Mm. So, Deborah, I want to ask you about another story that we have talked about before out of Sudan, not, not South Sudan, but Sudan. Uh, Nora Hussein, she is the teenager that was jailed after killing her rapist husband. She was forced to marry at the age of 16. She stabbed her husband to death as he attempted to rape her, and she was facing the death penalty. What's going on with that case? Well, finally, some good news in what has been a pretty bleak story today coming out of that part of the world. Um, Sudan, which is, as you correctly pointed out, the neighbor to South Sudan. South Sudan used to be part of Sudan. Nora Hussein was sentenced to death. There has been a massive international effort to get this child released from jail and have that um, death sentence commuted and turned away. And what we finally know is that although the, she still remains in jail, the death sentence has been commuted. We saw global celebrities, Naomi Campbell, Mira Sorvino, Emma Watson, all getting behind this campaign and her lawyers inside Sudan also working tirelessly to free Nora Hussein. That death sentence has now been commuted to five years in jail. A massive difference and a major victory, I think, for those campaigning for the rights of child brides and to do away with that issue in Sudan. Anne-Marie? Yeah, I suppose it is. It's still five years in prison, um, but I know she has been behind bars for a while now. Do we have any idea when she would actually get out? I mean, will some of the time that she's already been serving apply to that five years? I think that's the hope um, that it will apply so she could be out um, in a couple of years and maybe even get out on good behavior earlier than that. There'll certainly be attempts to try and make that happen. Amnesty International said while they're pleased that the death sentence is no longer being implemented, they're very disappointed that she's still in jail and it highlights the fact that the laws need to actually change in Sudan, that children need to go to school, they should not be being married. Nora Hussein herself, that's all she wanted to do was to study and she's committed herself to becoming a lawyer and studying for the rights of children in the future. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, you know, there are many more uh, Nora Husseins out there, and hopefully the international community does not forget about them uh, now that they've won at least one victory in this case. Deborah Pata from Johannesburg, thank you so much. Mm.